Hello, and welcome back on a cold, blustery day. Uh, this is June Edwards. I'm June Edwards, and I'm here as part of the Senior Topics Program from the North Orange County Community College System for Older Adults. Now, I'm recording the evening before our class. It's, the wind is blowing around my house outside. Every once in a while, something shakes a little bit. And uh, it's a blustery night out there, but we are warm and cozy in here. And I'm thinking about doing some cooking. So I wanted to show you, because it's fall, I wanted to show you some of the spices that we use in our baking leading up to Thanksgiving. The first one I have is cloves. And uh, you can see there, there's the title of it, cloves. And I'm going to take some out for each of these and I'm gonna put them on my plate here so you can see exactly what we've got going on. So I've got them a little bit out of order. Oh boy, is this a nice pungent smell. And these were some of the spices. You can see the color of it. Nice autumn color. I'm gonna put it on my plate. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, you can see it. Little bit, and I'm gonna get some more. Now that's cloves. I also uh, had some cloves here that are in a package and you can see these. And uh, there's little bits here before it gets ground up. I don't wanna take them out. Well, I'll take one out and show it to you. This is, I won't do that. This is how it comes in the bag and you can see these. And you can take them out and you can grind them in a grinder or like I have as a powder here. You can see the powder. <clears throat> so I have my cloves. The next one is called allspice. This has a much different smell. And it's uh, also from the Middle East and you know, Marco Polo was the one who introduced a lot of these spices to the European countries. This is almost the same color as the cloves. I'm going to put all spice on here. So now I've got two on there. I've got the all spice and I've got the ground cloves. If I were there at the facility, I would pass these around and you could smell them. Now, one of my very, very favorites, and maybe yours too, this is cinnamon. And so I've got my cinnamon here. I'm just going to sprinkle. This is a little bit oranger. A little bit of orange, but mostly brown still. So I'm going to put these other ones here on the side. So now I've got three on my plate. Let's see if I can get them to show to you. Yeah, if I bring it back like that. So I've got my allspice, my cloves, and in the middle here is the cinnamon. Oh, I love the smell of cinnamon in the breads, like zucchini bread. You know how you take your squashes from the garden and you use some of those. And I'm gonna put these out of the way here. Now the next one, uh, we use this a lot at Christmas in our eggnog. Mm, this is nutmeg and you can see here's the title, nutmeg. Camera's focusing in on it. Get some of this out. Take, what you can do with these is put all of these into some water and boil it in a saucepan on the stove like a potpourri. We used to take, when, when ladies were wearing pantyhose, we'd take a little bit of it and we'd put these spices together inside uh, a little piece of pantyhose and then we'd tie it shut and put it down into the boiling water 
and it would just make the whole room smell so nice for two, three hours. Okay, so this is nutmeg. You can use this in a lot of puddings, pies with pumpkin. Libby's pumpkin pie, canned pumpkin pie does a really brisk business. Now the next one <clears throat> is from Trader Joe's. And what they've done is they've taken all of these spices I mentioned, the allspice, the cinnamon, the cloves, and the nutmeg, and they put them together also maybe with a little ginger, maybe a little lemon or coriander, and they put this into the pumpkin spice mix. Oh yeah, I can smell them all together. It smells so good. So that saves you from having to get all these other little boxes out. The last one is especially for us Californians. We like to have a little peppery taste, uh, probably the Mexican culture influence in the cooking. This is crushed red pepper. Have you ever had this in some of your dishes? Especially good with uh, hamburger and beef. You could put it in with chicken, some of your other meat dishes. Put some of this out here. And it comes out, it's flakes, basically. And so you can put that in there. So now I look at my little plate and try to keep all the spices distinguished, but see if you can see what I've got. Oh, and here's the crushed pepper way over here. Uh, try to get it so you can see it. Maybe I can take a picture of this and put it up on the website. You get one, two, three, four, five different kinds of spices here. And yummy, yummy, yummy <laughs> for our tummy, tummy. Another thing I like to do is take a pumpkin scented candle and, bur and burn that in the kitchen for a few hours in the morning. So when people get up, they have a nice pumpkin spicy smell that they can smell. So, you know, autumn is so short in California. I wanted to talk about some interesting facts about autumn. We know that there's two different dates when autumn could be said to begin. And it's defined about or because of the way the earth is orbiting around the sun. We could say that autumn starts when the harvest time starts, which would be in August. We could say that it starts around the 22nd or 23rd of September. And the autumn equinox, you have 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night. And then after that, the days get shorter and the nights get longer, depending on how far north you are or south of the equator. Now, one of the most stunning signs of autumn is the turning of the leaves. And the shorter days are assigned to the trees to begin to prepare for winter. In the winter, there's not enough light for photosynthesis to occur. So as the days shorten during the autumn, the trees begin to close down their food production systems and reduce the amount of green chlorophyll in their leaves. And as they die off, they turn the beautiful yellows, oranges, and reds, and then they fall off the tree. That happens to some of the trees down in Southern California as well. The chemistry of color happens in autumn. Chlorophyll is a chemical which makes tree leaves green. So as it declines, the other chemicals in the leaves become more prominent. That's where you get the vibrant ambers, reds, and yellows of autumn. So some of the chemicals are the same as the ones that give carrots their orange color 
and egg yolks their yellow color. A fourth interesting fact about autumn, and this is based on scientific research, people born in the autumn months of September, October, and November, they found that babies born during the autumn months, they're likely more likely to live to be 100 than those born during the rest of the year. 30% of the people who reached 100 between 1880 and 1895 were born in the autumn months. Number five, I already mentioned, the days get shorter. And we notice the nights beginning draw, to draw in. And because we have ended daylight savings time a week ago, seems longer now, doesn't it? But our bodies are finally beginning to adjust to it. The night is longer than the day. And so people feel like hibernating more. Even my dogs want to sleep longer hours and my cats. They don't want to go out in the cold. This week at night is going to get down into the high 40s. Southern California, yeah. It won't be a freeze yet, but that could come in December. Now, there is a date for your diary. <clears throat> I don't think any of us will be around then, but September 24th, 2303. So that's in about 300 years. Generally speaking, the autumn equinox always falls on either the 22nd or 23rd of September. But because the Gregorian calendar is not quite in perfect symmetry with the Earth's orbit, very occasionally, the autumn equinox will fall on September 24th. The last time that happened was in 1931. Were any of you were born at that time? I don't think you'd remember it. You're probably pretty young. The next time it will happen will be the year 2303 or 2303. So autumn and fall, we typically think of fall as the North American version of the word autumn, but it was in widespread use in England until just recently. Originally a shortening of the phrase fall of the leaf, the phrase fall was common in England in the 17th century. The word autumn entered England from the French, autumne, and did not become common usage until the early 1900s. Did you know that squirrels get smarter in the fall? They say the size of their brain actually increases. How about that? So when the critters are bearing nuts and seeds in hundreds of scattered caches, to serve as emergency larders, a typical squirrel shows a 15% increase. And here's this little squirrel eating his nuts, looking at the camera, not realizing that we're looking at him. And I told you the fall babies uh, live longer, up to 100 years old, many more people. So us, those of us with September, October, November birthdays, that's going to happen. Autumn is good for the economy, especially in states like New Hampshire and Vermont and New York, where people travel to watch the leaves. They call it leaf peeping. And up until the time of the COVID, it was a $3 billion, with a B, dollar business in New England. It's also a cheaper time to travel when the kids are back in school. Now, how about, uh, let me see if I can find this. Oh, here's a good one for you. The sex drive spikes in the fall. Well, we all wanted to hear that. Testosterone levels in both men and women spike higher in autumn than at any other time of year. That's what different studies have found. September is the most popular birth month of the year. And love, love is on the air. More people want to get into a loving relationship 
as the winter is coming, they want someone to cozy up with. Animals have the same thing going on with them. The monarch butterflies, they are all leaving us. They're all flying down to the valleys in Southern Mexico, close to the equator. They're pretty much gone. They make autumn a migratory season. They travel at speeds between 12 and 25 miles per hour. And by now, most of them are gone because we've got a little rain this week and it's cold, cold winds blowing. And they're smart. They have already started to migrate up to 2,500 miles to nicer weather. Wow. And the Arctic turn. I'll show you a picture of the Arctic turn. There he is. The white and cuddly Arctic turn does an annual round trip migration of 44,000 zigzagging miles. But have you heard that joke? Uh, a trip of a thousand miles starts with one quick trip back into the house to pick up something you forgot. Da -dum. There's the drum roll. Okay. Now, um, the Aurora Borealis is more likely to occur in the fall. You can turn your eyes north, but unless you're up in Canada or parts of Alaska or parts of Maine, we're not really going to see it. But these geomagnetic storms occur when charged solar particles squeeze through the atmosphere and collide with gassy particles in the Earth's sky. Because we now have longer, clearer nights, this free light show occurs twice as often during the fall and winter months. Now, people say, well, okay, so does every place experience autumn? Nope. Autumn is a fact of life for most of us, but in tropical climates near the equator, like the Caribbean islands, the weather stays mild all year. Temperatures in Puerto Rico range from 75 to 85 year round. So it's going to look like this no matter what time of year you're thinking about. But let's say that... <clears throat> You want to take a drive and you want to go for a couple days. You're going to take your masks with you. You're going to obey all the social distancing rules. But where do you go for a weekend getaway in California? We know about our beautiful ocean. But look at those trees in central and northern California. Oh, yes. The summer fog dissipates. And you can now enjoy the clearest skies you may see all year long. Here's some top California destination places where you can see the fall foliage, taste the fruits from autumn harvest, or enjoy a seasonal activity. Or when we get our vaccines and we're out and about, a seasonal festival. Here's the Napa Valley at harvest time. Uh, not that crowded this year because a lot of the wineries are shut down. But a few of them are still open. So that's one place to think about. Put it down for next year once we're out and about again. Another place is Scenic Highway 395, which goes north and south along the eastern edge of the Sierra Nevadas. Look at those beautiful trees. And the yellow ones are aspens. Another place you can go is Hearst Castle, which in the autumn, the summer crowds have thinned out and uh, they like to have a night tour where you can see a whole nother side to this gorgeous, gorgeous place built in Central California by the newspaper tycoon. William Randolph Hearst. Closer to home, you can go south to Julian. It is time for apples. 
In the 1800s, treasure seekers rushed to Julian looking for gold. It's between here and San Diego. The gold ran out, but the little gold rush town survived. Today, it has an attractive downtown area, and many people go for a different kind of golden treasure that also comes in red and green, the apples. And if you haven't had an apple pie baked from the apples harvested near Julian, my, my, you are missing something. When you take a drive through Julian, you will find roadside stands selling apple varieties you may have never even heard of. You can buy them ready to go, or on a non-COVID year, you could pick them yourself for a fun afternoon with family and friends. And that is only about an hour and a half south of here. Something to think about for next year. Also think about Lake Tahoe. That's another place, but really close to home. I don't know if I've showed this to you or not. Up there off Brea Boulevard in Fullerton, one of the residents at Morningside took this gorgeous shot of the maple trees, the Japanese maple trees bred to survive the heat of Southern California summers. So a lot of lovely, lovely things to think about. And here is a magazine called Country Extra, which has lovely, lovely sights to see. And before we leave the topic of autumn, here's a story by Agnes Kane. Fall has always been my favorite season, she wrote. The pace is slower as we realize that summer is once again fading into fall. Dawn creeps over the hill like a bashful schoolboy, and the shadow of the hill darkens the door long before the day's work is done. There's a chill in the air that makes the kitchen's warmth most welcome in the morning, yet the afternoon sun drifts softly warm and gentle across tired shoulders. With military-like precision, wild geese and butterflies fly south, leaving an echo and an emptiness closer to home. A few reckless robins perch on the high branches and chirp as if there will be no winter. Soon they'll realize the truth, and like the birds and butterflies before them, head south. Even as we watch the colorful leaves turning, one leaf will fall, then another and another until all too soon, the bare bones of the trees show through. A strong gust of wind, like what we're having today, brings a blizzard of leaves that pile up along the fence and spill into the driveway where they crackle and crunch underfoot. Nature's great fall show is almost over for another year. Isn't that lovely? All right, well, we're gonna move to another topic. You know, we still have a few forest fires burning in our state, not as many as we had, but a few. And I wanna take you to a wonderful holiday this week. And it's November 11th, which is Veterans Day. And I would like to um, read to you just a couple things about Veterans Day. And I'm looking to see what I have here. This is where we remember our veterans. Do you know that more veterans live in California than anywhere else? This map shows where the population has been. The states that are the darkest have the most vets and they tend to like the Southern part of the country. So you can see California has quite a few. This day was originally called Armistice Day. It was not until President Dwight Eisenhower signed legislation in 1954 
that November 11th became Veterans Day. In order for businesses and schools to have a three-day weekend, the day was moved in 1971 to the fourth Monday in October. And most citizens were not happy with that shuffling. So in 1975, President Gerald Ford signed a law returning the observation to November 11th. The roots of veterans aid in the US traces back to 1636 when the pilgrims were a Plymouth colony were at war with the Pequot Indians. The pilgrims passed a law that the colony would support all wounded soldiers. The Continental Congress also provided pensions to disabled soldiers. In 1811, the first medical facility for veterans was established. After the Civil War, many veterans homes were established. And so there are people who still to this day receive care at those homes. If you get a chance to write a thank you note to the veterans, please do so. Or if you've got veterans in your facility, try to find a way to honor them this week on the 11th, okay? The GI Bill was signed into law <clears throat> June 22, 1944. That had more impact on the American way of life than even the Homestead Act of 1862. In 1947, after World War II had ended, veterans were 49% of the college students. In 1952, the VA backed nearly two and a half million home loans. There are still educational benefits for service members to this day. And we have grown from 73 veteran cemeteries in 1870 to 147 in 2005. Now, most of the cer ceremonies for veterans have been uh, canceled this year. I know the, uh, the flag ceremony that's held in orange has had to be canceled, although people are buying flags and taking them out and putting them on the graves of their loved veterans. So that's pretty much it. <clears throat> we do wanna honor the veterans who served. And in closing, I want to read a poem that was written during World War I by John Gillespie McGee Jr. He was born in Shanghai, China in 1922. When McGee was just 18 years old, he entered flight training and was sent to England. Actually, this was during World War II in 1941. He flew the Spitfire and was promoted to the rank of pilot officer. German bombers were crossing the English Channel regularly to attack Britain's cities and factories. On September 3, 1941, McGee flew a Spitfire 5 test flight, which inspired him to write the following poem. That same day, he wrote a letter to his parents, which included the now famous poem. Three months later, on December 11, 1941, three days after our country entered the war and four days after Pearl Harbor, John Gillespie McGee Jr. was killed. He was just 19 years old. Here's what he wrote. He wrote, actually, he wrote the poem in Flanders Field, The Poppies Blow, Between the Crosses, Row on Row. And do you know the rest of it? I'm trying to look for it. My mother has that memorized because all school children memorize this poem about the poppies. And I'm sorry, I can't find that one. But I have another one that I wanna to read to you. 
written by another vet. It says, The Things That Make a Soldier Great by Edgar Guest. The things that make a soldier great and send him out to die, to face the flaming cannon's mouth, nor ever question why, are lilacs by a little porch, the row of tulips red, the peonies and pansies too, the old petunia bed, the grass plot where his children play, the roses on the wall, tis these that make a soldier great, he's fighting for them all. Tis not the pomp and pride of kings that makes a soldier brave. Tis not allegiance to the flag that over him may wave. For soldiers never fight so well on land or on the foam as when behind the cause they see the little place called home. In danger but that humble street whereon his children run. You make a soldier of the man who never bore a gun. What is it through the battle smoke the valiant soldier sees? The little garden far away, the budding apple trees. The little patch of ground back there, the children at their play. But to this spot, wherever it be, the humblest spot called home. The homesick soldiers far away know something's in the air. The tulips come to bloom again, the grass once more is green, and every man sees the spot where all his joys have been. And we want to dedicate that to the memory of all brave Americans, living or those who've passed on in remembrance. And one last picture here. I love this one by Norman Rockwell, showing the returning soldier who is so glad to be back home. God bless you. God bless America. God bless the spirit of liberty in our United States of America. Have a great rest of your week. I miss you. I hope to be with you someday soon. Bye, everybody. See you next week.